morning, everyone. Today is June 1st, 2023, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food project founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in the spring of 2020. Every Thursday morning, Gene Lawler and I are delighted to host another cutting edge program designed for mediators, arbitrators, lawyers, everybody in the world of dispute resolution, everybody who negotiates. As you all know, there's no charge for these great webinars. Rather, we ask people to contribute to a food bank if they like what they see. And wow, have our audiences been generous. One of my favorite parts of the program each week is when we announce the running total of just how much our generous audiences have contributed in honor of our great speakers. Gene Lawler, would you please do the honors? Oh, thank you, Jeff. It's so great to uh, give you this number. We've passed the $400,000 mark. $406,011.07. Every penny counts. So that's fantastic. Thank you all. That is just thrilling. Thank you, one and all. Now let's turn to today's program with Elizabeth Hill. She's going to be talking about ombuds. What's in a name? Ombuds, also known as ombudsperson and ombudsman, are ADR practitioners who have unique and often misunderstood roles. Ombuds have existed since the 1700s. Their roles and functions have evolved over the years and they're now found in government, private sector, higher education, K through 12 education, law firms, corporations, nonprofits, prisons, nursing homes, newspapers, and many other institutions. The evolution has created a variety of ombuds models. They sometimes cause confusion, yet the essence of any ombuds program remains the same, to provide comprehensive conflict management options to help institutions and constituents informally resolve matters at the lowest possible level and hold up a mirror to their organization government entity, or other institution. In this program, Liz is going to explore three common ombuds models in the United States, classical, advocate, and organizational, and explore the burgeoning role of the organizational ombuds. Liz Hill is the Associate Director for the University of Colorado Boulder Ombuds Office. She joined that office in May of 2016. Liz is an attorney, trained mediator, and certified organizational ombudsman practitioner. Prior to joining the University of Colorado at Boulder, Liz served as an Arizona Assistant Attorney General, Assistant Ombudsman for the State of Arizona, Organizational Ombudsman for Apollo Education Group, and partner of the Hill Firm, PLLC. Liz is a graduate of Gonzaga University School of Law, and earned her bachelor's degree from Northern Arizona University. She's a member of the State Bar of Arizona, the International Ombudsman Association, and the ABA Section of Dispute Resolution, serving in several leadership positions. ABA DR Council Member, Budget Officer, Executive Committee Member, Chair of the IOA Certification of Organizational Ombuds Practitioners, Recertification Committee, and IOA mentor. She also co-founded Ombuds, the University of Colorado Ombuds blog, and Ombuds Linked, a professional LinkedIn discussion group for practicing Ombuds. Liz, we'd love to hear about the food bank to which you would like people to contribute if they're in a position to contribute. And then on with the presentation. The floor okay. is yours. Well, thank you so much. That was quite the um, introduction, uh, Jeff, so thank you for all of that. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now and get us started. Um, everyone, uh, I'm going to open the chat as well, and I encourage you all to open the chat, please, because I will be um, asking you some questions. Is everyone, is it good? Everyone sees a slide that has uh, food bank information on it? Yes? Give me a thumbs up. Okay, thanks, Windsor. I see your thumb. I can't see everybody, so thank you for that. Um, so yes, the food bank that I chose uh, for today's session is Food Bank of the Rockies, and they serve um, 
both Colorado and Wyoming communities helping those in need. So I'm so excited, um, number one, to be here. So thank you, Natalie, Jeff, um, for including me and inviting me here. Um, I have chills just, just being part of this. And for over 400,000, it's just, I don't know, I was hearing more about the backstory of how this all started. And it's really quite um, an amazing feat. So congratulations to all of you. So this, as Jeff said, this program is free. The idea is to please donate to the food bank and help um, those in need across Colorado and Wyoming. I appreciate that. Okay, so moving forward. All right, thanks for all the feedback in the chat. That's helpful. Um, so I don't think I need to, let's see here. Why is my cursor not moving me forward? Here we go. Um, I don't think I need to talk much about myself, but our topic today, hopefully we're all in the right place, is about ombuds. And as Jeff said, we will be talking about, you know, the fact that it's a pretty unusual name. Um, not a lot of people are familiar with the ombuds or the profession. So hopefully my goal today is after today, uh, you will also agree that it's an important service and probably uh, maybe one of the most, if not the most, misunderstood and underutilized functions in the field of alternative dispute resolution. So I'm here to try to remedy that, give all of you some greater awareness of the profession, and hopefully you will spread the word as well. Um, as Jeff said, I'm Liz Hill. I've done a variety of things um, as an attorney, a mediator, and an ombuds. I've been an ombuds now for 16 years, 12 of those years as an organizational ombuds. However, my entry into the profession uh, was as a classical ombuds, and we'll be talking about what that is in just a few moments. I do, I want this to be interactive um, and casual, so I do encourage questions as we go. I'll keep my eye on the chat. I'm also mindful of time. I've got a lot of information I wanna share and we've got less than an hour. So um, if I know we're gonna to get to something, I may table it, but I will leave time at the end to cover any questions we haven't gotten to. And hopefully Jeff, Jean, Natalie, you can all um, help me monitor that. I would appreciate it. Um, and finally, I do see some ombuds colleagues in the audience. So thanks for being here. And of course, supplement, feel free to chime in and supplement something that I may miss along the way. All right, so the learning objectives for today are really twofold. First is to recognize and differentiate among these different ombuds models, and we're gonna focus on three, and to understand and appreciate in particular the burgeoning role of the organizational ombuds, which is what I do currently um, serve as here at the University of Colorado Boulder. So before we go any further, let's just take a pause, little uh, activity here. We'll do a quick poll. I wanna get an idea of how familiar you all are with ombuds. So I'm gonna launch the poll here and I'll read it out for those who may not be able to see it. Um, the question is, my familiarity with ombuds can best be described as, I'm an expert, I am one. Um, I've worked with them, I'm familiar, or I've heard of them, but not really sure what they do, or I have no idea, and that's why I'm here. And there's no right or wrong answers. Um, really just trying to gauge who's here and how familiar you are. Okay, so great. We have at least one person who has no idea. So thank you for showing up to learn. Um, a few of you, as I said, five who are experts, who are ombuds. Six of you have worked with them, okay. And nine or 10 of you have heard of them but aren't entirely sure. So great. Um, hopefully today you will walk away with a better understanding. So thanks for doing that. All right, up oh, here, I can share the results with you. There you go. All right. Okay, so let's keep moving. Um, hopefully everyone can kind of still see where we are. I've got lots of things on my screen, so bear with me. All right, so the first thing that we wanna do is, as Jeff said, is talk about what is this definition? And also it's important to learn how do we pronounce this word? So the name ombudsman, I'm gonna pronounce ombudsman, uh, really has old, comes from Old Norse origins. And in Scandinavian, it means, the literal definition means representative. So nowadays, as we've been alluding to, there are a number of different titles and names for this position. Ombuds is one of them. Also, ombudsman is still commonly used throughout the U.S. and around the world. Ombuds person. And then there's others. There's different variations, especially across Europe and other parts of the, uh, the world. 
The International Ombuds Association, which um, is the primary association for organizational ombuds, has in the past year or so officially adopted the term ombuds as its gender neutral, all inclusive term for ombuds. Other ombudsman associations, um, they have not done that yet. They feel very, some of them actually, in fact, feel very strongly about using the original term ombudsman. And that's for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons being because that's what their statutes say, and we'll talk about statutory authority. So they wanna be consistent with their statutory authority. So there are different variations around the world. And I will be using the terms interchangeably throughout this presentation. So hopefully I'm not offending anyone, but I will be using all the terms. And this definition provided here, it's a very basic um, definition attempting to really get to that fundamental purpose of ombuds. And it's generally someone, you know, as Jeff said, who's independent, impartial, confidential, who's really there to help, try to help resolve disputes and surface issues at the lowest level possible. Now, the one um, caveat to this definition is for our advocate ombuds, they are not impartial. They are charged with advocating for their constituent group. And we'll, and we'll see more of that in just a few moments. Um, so as while well, this title is used for many roles, um, it can look very different from one program to another. And as Jeff said, ombuds work in all different organizations. And I think sometimes people, if they're familiar with one type of ombuds, that's how they see all ombuds. But it's important to know that um, ombuds work, you know, as we said, government, colleges, universities, K through 12, which is probably one of the most up and coming areas where we see a lot of um, different programs emerging corporations, hospitals, healthcare, prisons, nonprofits, um, conference ombuds. Yes, yeah, some associations will hire an ombuds to come be their conference ombuds so that people who are attending the conference, if they have issues or concerns that they don't wanna to take to staff or to colleagues or to other leaders in the organization, they have a safe place to, to raise and talk through those concerns. So lots of different variations happening. Um, and like I said, I feel I have a professional duty to make sure we're saying it right. This is a tough word for a lot of folks. People add M's and B's and S's in different places. So I'm going to say it and then we'll maybe you can repeat after me, even though I can't hear all of you. Um, I know I can hear like Jeff and some of the others who can unmute themselves. We'll just say it together. So I'm going to say it once. Ombudsman. Repeat after me. Ombudsman. Thank you. You did it beautifully. Yes. And I see, um, I'm looking at the chat. Charlie, I do see your um, question about the presentation slides. Sure. I'm happy to share them. Um, not all of them are going to have a lot of substantive information on them, but I'm happy to share what I have afterwards. Not a problem. Okay, so let's keep going. All right, so quick history lesson now. Uh, the first, so I don't have all the information on here, but I'm going to share a lot with you. So, so bear with me. The first Swedish ombudsman was established, believe it or not, back in 1713. And they were established to do what you might suspect, expect. They were to respond to public complaints against government actions and protect citizens from abuses. And then in 1809, the role was codified into the Swedish constitution. So that's really um, where, all, where things began. Other countries throughout Europe and New Zealand then started embracing this idea and this concept in the uh, early or actually the mid 1900s. The US finally caught on in the 1960s. And um, that was you know, due to a variety of unrest, civil unrest. Um, the first academic institution was Eastern Montana College in 1966. So if you're writing these little fun facts down, you're gonna be an expert in ombuds trivia. Um, and maybe we can play that next time, I don't know. All right, Hawaii created the first government office in 1969, and that was a classical ombuds office. And then federal ombuds programs really started to emerge. We first saw them in the United States Department of Health, Education and Welfare, the Smithsonian Institute, and yes, the US Secret Service had an ombuds program. So that's really where it started in the federal um, government. Then we move on to the 70s. The US started embracing the idea of an advocate ombuds model. And that's where the long-term, some of you might be or be familiar with long-term care ombudsman. And that's really when where that concept was born. 
Now in the United States, federal law requires every state to have a long-term care ombudsman program. So that really um, took off. And we'll see in a minute, I'll show you the federal law that requires that and you can look it up if you're interested. Then we move on to the 1990s. And that's where we really saw an expansion throughout the US federal government. Um, and now we have literally hundreds of federal ombudsman um, programs. So just to kind of where we are today, again, there's a variety. There's only five true statewide classical ombudsman programs, believe it or not. Um, and that is still Hawaii. They still have their program. And then we have Alaska, Arizona, Iowa, and Nebraska. And the Arizona classical statewide ombudsman office is where I started my ombuds career. We also have hundreds of other uh, public sector ombuds that mirror in some, to some extent, that classical model, um, but may not adhere to all um, the standards or follow all of their um, uh, practices. But they are throughout, and they're not usually not statewide. They might be in local government, counties, cities, things of that nature, or within a government agency. Um, colleges and universities, probably the most popular. Um, I, I see some of my colleagues here. Five, 700 programs at least. Uh, corporations, probably about 25 right now. And then 30 K through 12s. And like I said earlier, that's really the most popular emerging K through 12 school districts are really, um, really um, embracing this concept. Nonprofits, probably about 40, healthcare about nine, and then hundreds of federal programs. Now, um, if you're interested in, in kind of following that, and, and maybe you're interested in looking into an ombuds as a career, um, as an ADR professional, uh, Tom Kosakowski, one of our colleagues, ombuds colleagues at University of Southern California, has an ombuds blog. It's just, um, you can just Google ombuds blog. I don't have the link right here, but maybe someone can find it and put it in the chat for me. Um, and if you follow the blog, he is amazing. He captures all the different, you know, any anytime something happens in the ombuds world, he captures it. New programs opening, programs closing, programs expanding, changes of personnel. So that's really a great place to kind of keep your thumb on the pulse. Thanks, Georgie, um, for putting that link in the chat. That's really a great place to kind of keep your thumb on the pulse of the ombud, or organizational ombuds, at least, community. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention here before we move on is the ABA. So earlier, Jeff mentioned that I am in leadership roles, and it looks like maybe someone's trying to get in, Jeff. Um, I don't know if you want to admit them. Um, uh, the American Bar Association Section of Dispute Resolution has an ombuds committee, and back in 2017, the ABA adopted a resolution that encouraged, or encourages, I should say, greater use of ombuds programs that adhere to recognized standards. Thanks, Ken. Oh, great. Ken is here. He's um, one of our federal ombuds. Uh, and so that was a that was an encouraging the folks to really embrace this concept, but also to ensure that they're adhering to some recognized standards. And as we're going to learn about different ombuds models have different standards. So really for organizations or entities or governments thinking about what kind of ombuds model makes sense for us, what are we trying to accomplish, and then what standards of practice are we going to hear, adhere to. So that's really an important um, analysis to make. Okay, so moving along. Um, so it's really difficult, if you haven't figured it out already, um, difficult to compartmentalize ombuds programs into one box like a simple box. And that's simply because even within these three models that you see here, the programs are gonna vary. And so um, today my intent really is to give you kind of that 30,000 view um, you know, of these common models in the US. And then we'll take a closer look, you know, digging into the organizational ombuds model. But high level classical ombuds, right? I already mentioned developed to ensure fair, uh, ensure, sorry, fair treatment for citizens, residents, members of the public. Um, and this mirrors that original model we saw back in 1713 in Sweden. The advocate model, really there to develop to protect individual rights and interests and serve you know, as a resource for folks who may be um, facing some kind of power imbalance, residents of um, long-term care facilities, patients in hospitals, prisoners in prisons, things of that nature. And then you have the organizational model, which was developed as a resource to help manage conflict within organizations. All right, so let's take a look first at the classical model. 
The primary role of classical ombuds is to help constituents cut through that red tape, right? To ensure that public entities are acting appropriately and people are getting stuck and not getting stymied in the bureaucracy. Classical ombudsmen are um, often elected um, by their constituents or they may be appointed by a legislature. So the five statewide classical ombuds I have mentioned are elected by their, or I'm sorry, appointed by their legislature. And they're charged with receiving and investigating complaints and concerns. Thank you, Natalie. Um, you know, re related to agencies within their jurisdiction, whatever the, their jurisdiction might be. So the jurisdiction might be limited, but the issues are far and wide. So you might see everything, or classical ombuds might see everything from uh, public record and open meeting law questions and disputes, which is what I did at the Arizona office, all the way through, you know, to um, uh, criminal misconduct, right, and everything in between. So it's a very wide range of issues. Unlike the advocate and organizational ombuds models, they do have the authority to conduct investigations that really makes them unique, and they also then make recommendations um, for redress, right, or maybe a policy change. And their authority, whatever their authority is, is typically uh, provided by statute, and, you know, the scope of the office, again, might vary depending on that enabling legislation. The Arizona Ombudsman Citizens Aid Office, which I know I keep referring to, but that's what I'm most familiar with as a classical ombudsman, breaks its services down into three buckets. One is coaching people, you know, empowering them, giving them the information they need to go resolve their own issue. Um, assistance, you know, maybe making phone calls to try to grease the wheels, if you will, of the government and try to get things moving in the right direction and get them connected with the right people or whatever the case may be, or an investigation, really, if there's some merit to the complaint, really looking into what's going on and what might need to be um, changed. So I see some comments coming in. I'm going to go check the chat real quick. And how do I see it over here? So thank you, Ken, for the um, website, for the Coalition, we'll be getting to them in a minute. Um, yes, and Windsor says classical seems to have some things in common with the military inspector general's office. Yes, and we can talk more about that. Um, there is there are slight differences between the classical and the inspector general, but sure, they are going to look, um, they can look very similar. In fact, I have that as one of my examples. Um, but maybe we'll come back to that if there's time at the end, we can talk more about that. Thanks for pointing that out, Windsor. Um, the USOA, it stands for the United States Ombudsman Association, I've got it here, is the professional association that serves classical and public sector ombudsmen. And they also provide a model act, which helps inform and influence legislation. So when states or local governments are going to create statutory or authority or codes of some sorts, um, uh, they can they can refer to this model act. And David, thank you. I see you put the link. You guys are way ahead of me. I was going to give all those at the end, but this is great. We'll be talking about the IOA as well. Um, so thanks for doing all that. But the USOA is really the uh, USOA is what serves the classical folks. And so therefore, um, standards of practice, if you will, are here for you to look at: independence, impartiality, confidentiality and notice the credible review. I want to talk a little bit about that. So independence is that exactly what you would think. They're not aligned and they don't report to any of the agencies they might ultimately have to investigate. I know at the um, in Arizona, our statutory authority required that our offices be at least one full mile away from any of the other state agencies that we might be dealing with. So that's just an example of they take the independence very, very seriously. Impartiality is really they do. They don't just always um, go and investigate. They're really looking at all sides of an issue before determining whether that's the best course of action or what best what the best course of action might be. Confidentiality is that they don't share identifying information. Um, and statute will specify what uh, records specifically are confidential by law. The credible review is important because by design, a classical ombuds can't compel or enforce acceptance of any findings or recommendations it might have from an investigation. So they don't really have any teeth per se. So they have to be very persuasive and influential. And to do that, as you can all probably imagine, they have to have high quality report. They have to make sure that their investigation and their reports are rigorous, they're fair, and they're transparent. 
So they really have to make sure they, you know, what's what's that adage? Cross their T's, dot their I's, whatever, um, to to make sure that they that their recommendations are going to be taken seriously and be heard. And I see all this info in the chat. Thank you to everybody. This is fantastic. I appreciate all the um, supplemental info. Okay. So that's classical. Now we move on to the advocate. Let me check in. Any um, other than the inspector general comparison, any questions about classical before I move on? <clears throat> I don't see anything popping up. And we can talk more later too. Okay, so let's move on to the advocate. Um, advocate ombudsman may also work in the public or private sectors. And they too will evaluate claims objectively, but oftentimes they are authorized or maybe even mandated to advocate on behalf of whoever their constituent group is, the individuals or groups that are being aggrieved. Um, and so again, the, the co most common example here in the US anyway, is the long-term care ombudsman. We also have children's ombudsmen, patient om ombudsmen and prisoner ombudsmen, as I mentioned. And this is the federal law um, that supports uh, the long-term um, care ombudsman authority. And like I said, every state has one. And they too, I don't know if I have any long-term care folks here, but they too have their own professional association. And maybe if someone has some quick fingers, they can put a link in the chat for me. Um, it's called the National Association of State Ombudsman Programs. The acronym is NASOP, N-A-S-O-P. Okay. Finally, we get to the organizational ombuds. I know I'm, I'm dumping a lot of information. So thanks, Ken, for putting that in the um, chat. So um, I'm giving you a lot of info. So I appreciate your listening ears. Um, an organizational ombuds is an independent and impartial person um, with whom someone can speak confidentially, informally, and truly off the record. You know, maybe they want to receive information, maybe they want guidance, um, or want to just talk through a concern about an, the organization's, you know, an issue or a concern or question related to the organization. But they also can look for trends and patterns and bring systemic concerns to the attention of the organization for resolution. And when we get towards the end, we're gonna kind of sort through the benefits. You know, what are the benefits to the individual versus what are the benefits to the organization? And of course, there's some overlap there as well. Um, but really they're that safe space to have these conversations. And typically they can address any issue related to the organization. Everything from communication and interpersonal or just needing help navigating um, resources all the way through, you know, harassment, discrimination, fraud, um, or other criminal misconduct, research, you know, at the university, research misconduct. Again, wide range of issues. There's really nothing that I can think of that we wouldn't um, at least hear or talk to someone about. Um, most organizational ombuds, and I'm careful to say all because there are, there are nuances here, um, adhere to the International Ombuds Associations for Standards of Practice. And David earlier put the link to IOA in the chat for you. And these four uh, standards are confidential, and you're gonna see some commonalities here, right? To our classical colleagues. Confidential, independent, impartial, right? All same, but here's the difference. We don't have that credible review standard because we're not doing investigations and report writing on issues. We do do annual reports, that's a different conversation, but we are informal, right? So we do not, and I say we, because that's what, how, what I serve as, as an organizational ombuds, we do not participate in any internal or external formal process, and we are completely off the record. So we don't even document that someone is calling us or coming to use our services. Um, and we call people who use our services visitors. That's important because I will be using that term. But we don't want any record, any paper trail um, that links that person to us. We want them to have a truly zero barrier, safe space to come and talk and have that initial consultation to talk through what's going on. Importantly, it's also voluntary, right? People can't be required to come to the ombuds. And that's important too. I don't know about my other ombuds colleagues here, but I know in my um, in our space, I'll get we'll get calls from managers and Georgie's here. She can attest to this. Georgie's my program admin at CU Boulder. P managers will call and be like, "Hey, I need you to do a mediation, you know, between so and so and so and so, or I need you to, I need you to tell so and so or coach so and so on how to handle something." And that's not how we work. We really need the visitor, the individual who's involved, to reach out and initiate that process. We don't just kind of swoop in. 
Um, and, you know, and even if a manager is encouraging or, you know, sharing our resource with someone, which is wonderful, um, we will talk about the voluntary nature when they come to our office because we want them to know if they're there because their manager is requiring them to be there, they are free to get up and leave at any moment. They do not have to stay and talk to us. Um, so I just want to be very clear about that. So organizational ombuds are really you know, acting as a trusted resource for anyone and everyone um, in an organization, all levels. Um, you know, they can discuss any concerns or just think through things about any kind of fear of, you know, retaliation or formal repercussions. Now, who do we serve? Um, and Ty, I see your comment. I'll look in a second. Organizational ombuds, and I say typically because there is some variation here. Like earlier, I remember I told you it's hard to put ombuds in, a, in any kind of a box. That's even because within the organizational ombuds world, programs vary. So organizational ombuds typically serve internal constituents. What do I mean by that? Employees, students, staff, faculty. Some may also offer um, services to external. So like if I have a parent or a contractor who's got a university related issue, I'm more than happy to meet with them and talk to them and try to help them uh, navigate and work through whatever it is. I don't think all ombuds would do that. And some organizational ombuds might not call themselves organizational ombuds, but they are embedded in an organization and only serve external audiences, customers, clients, consumers, but they're dealing with that organization's issues. They're helping those external folks navigate the institution. So as you can see, definitely some nuances there. Um, I will note, and I know we've got at least one federal ombuds here, Ken, um, that federal ombuds, most federal ombuds programs are organizational ombuds. I think Ken considers his more of a classical role. Um, but if you're more interested in learning more about federal ombuds programs, a couple resources. One is the link that Ken put in the chat already for the Coalition of Federal Ombudsmen. And at the end, I'm going to be providing a link. Um, Natalie's going to, she can put it in now, I guess, the ACUS study. And that is the, um, oh my gosh, now I got to remember the, uh, um, the name of uh, ACUS, I'm drawing up, the Administrative Conference, there we go. The Administrative Conference of the United States study did a, I don't know, 700, 800 page study on federal ombuds programs. So have at it, you can learn all you ever want to know um, about federal ombuds programs there. So Ty, I'm gonna look at your comment if you've not already done so, what is the difference between a mediator and an ombudsman? I have not talked about that. So the difference is an ombudsman mediation is one piece, one tool, if you will, of an ombuds practice. Ombuds do a lot more than mediation. Um, and we're going to be talking about some of the other services ombuds provide in a few moments. So if you can bear with me, I promise you we'll get there. Ken, awesome. ACA study link in the chat. There you go. Have fun. Um, <laughs> there is an executive summary if you don't want to read all 700 pages. I think the executive summary is always 60. Okay. All right. So um, let's see, I went, the, I went the wrong way. Let's see, let's keep going forward. Okay, here's a quick video on organizational ombuds. I thought I would share, it's only two minutes. So I'm gonna go ahead and play that so you can take a break from listening to me for a moment um, and hear from some of our other folks. And I don't know that I, I'm gonna pause it for a second and stop sharing because I don't think I clicked the video optimization. So let me do that real quick. Share sound. Okay. It was good to see all your faces for a minute there. Okay, this should sound better. For decades, organizational ombuds have provided confidential, neutral, informal, and independent guidance to people and organizations worldwide. In an era increasingly defined by conflict and accelerated change, ombuds have an important service to offer. Who are ombuds? They are trusted navigators, engaged by people and organizations to inform critical decisions for a lasting and positive impact. An ombud serves as a safe, off-the-record resource for employees, students, faculty, managers, executives, and citizens seeking ways to identify and address workplace issues and other concerns. They use their unique skill set to help people develop options for addressing these issues, separate from, but often complementing the work of HR, legal, and compliance. Ombuds today understand that addressing a difficult issue is often the crucible 
through which individuals and organizations must pass before fairness, positive change, and progress can be achieved. The modern ombuds empowers individuals to work through conflicts and concerns and helps organizations examine risks, strengthen culture, and address issues that stand in the way of achieving their goals. To that end, ombuds facilitate a journey beyond the issue or conflict. Those they serve emerge transformed, empowered, and prepared to reach their full potential. For any organization in need of a trusted resource to help navigate today's complex social and work environments, the modern ombuds is a transformative force toward more ethical, engaged, fair, and empowered organizations and communities around the world. To find out more about the value of the modern ombuds, please visit us at www.ombudsassociation.org. Okay. So I don't know, Ty, hopefully that gives you a little bit more. Um, we're going to be talking, we'll be diving in um, into more of the services and, and things that ombuds offer. Um, but that gives you kind of a nice overview. The International Ombudsman Association created that um, several years ago. And I think it's a really nice overview um, of our role. Okay, what do others think? You can just kind of put comments in the chat while I move forward here. Um, if that, is that worth showing? I need to know for next time I do this. Um, so let me know if that's worth showing or not. Okay, so, okay, good. <laughs> okay, I see some yeps in the chat. Um, and Windsor, I just wanna go back real quick while we were watching the video, I, I went back to look at my notes and I specifically did, I thank you for bringing up the inspector general. I did specifically um, make a note about that because that's a common confusion. So the classical ombuds and the inspector, um, the inspector general's role, the key distinction here, and I'll just read from my notes, is that an ombudsman's inquiry isn't limited to whether the government or its officials acted lawfully, lawfully or consistent with policy. Um, it's a more broad um, investigation or inquiry, right? It's looking to see, were they reasonable? Were they fair? Was anything else otherwise objectionable? So the ombuds takes a much broader view um, than the inspector general. So hopefully that would help. And John, thanks. I'm glad you liked the video. Thanks for that. Okay. So moving forward, you know, what are some of the services that ombuds provide? And again, this is going to vary from one program to another. But my colleague, Jessica Kuchamilla, who some of you may know, she's the ombuds at Duke University. She, and she gave me permission to share this, she did a great job, I think, compartmentalizing organizational ombuds services. And she put them into four buckets, facilitate, navigate, illuminate, and educate. So I'm gonna flesh those out a bit. So when I say ombuds facilitate, what does that mean? I've said it already. We provide that safe zero, zero barrier opportunity where visitors can come in, they can share, they can talk through their concerns, they can explore you know, a variety of potential options to address those concerns and maybe even resolve them. Um, facilitation can cover everything from you know, providing that space, providing guidance, doing show diplomacy between different people involved to kind of, um, you know, get the ball rolling or get people to enough common understanding and, and uh, common ground that they can have their own conversation. Maybe it is conducting informal mediations. And I say informal because we don't create records. We're not doing any kind of mediation agreements um, or when the part, you know, when the participants come to agreements, we're not recording those, right? It's a very, it's, it's more of a facilitated conversation with the third party neutral there to you know, provide a safe space, provide a process, ask clarifying questions, ensure everyone has a chance to be fully heard, right? To fully express themselves. So that's kind of what our, and, and maybe different ombuds here do it differently, but what our informal mediations might look like. And then we also facilitate group discussions so we can work with groups, um, on a variety of different issues to help them um, address whatever it is that's going on within their team or their group. Um, ombuds help navigate um, because they're really helping other folks, visitors, as I mentioned, understand you know, organizational policies, practices, procedures. We're connecting them. We're kind of like the master connector, right? Connecting them with the different other different appropriate resources across the organization. We may be offering them communication and conflict coaching, right, to help them think through what are the skills they need so that they can confidently and competently um, have a conversation or address this, right? Where would they go within the organization? How might they strategize that? 
Um, how might they frame a conversation, right? So we're really helping them strategize and paving that path forward. And I will say before I forget, one of the most, one of the key distinctions for an ombuds versus other resources um, in, within an organization is that the visitor truly owns that next step. We're there to help them make an informed decision on what that next step looks like. We don't tell them what to do. We don't force them to do anything. We're not going to share any information or have to investigate it or, you know, um, let someone else know what's going on. They get to leave that initial consult completely empowered to decide what they do next, including nothing, right? They could decide, you know what, I'm not going to do anything right now. And that's okay. So that's really um, one of the unique I think um, aspects of an, um, an ombuds. Ombuds um, illuminate um, because like I mentioned, systemic stuff, right? We help track and we identify trends. We illuminate that by bringing those problems and concerns um, to leadership, things that affect the entire or the entire community, right? The organization's entire community. We can provide feedback to an organization and senior le leadership maybe about those issues, trends, policies, procedures, without disclosing any identities, right? Or without sharing any of the communications that we've had with those visitors. And then finally, um, but educate by doing what you would ex what, what you would think education means, right? Uh, providing workshops, performing training, disseminating educational materials, really trying to help um, improve individual conflict, you know, resolution and effective communication skills but also then turning that into a larger um, impact, which is helping really promote a conflict competent culture, right? And an ethical culture within an organization, making you know, the community more resilient, making people more flexible and open to collaboration. So that's really um, one of the goals of an ombuds program is to help foster um, that within, a, within the community. Any thoughts or questions on that before um, I move on to what ombuds don't do? I'm looking at the chat. I don't see anything coming in and we're already almost at 40 minutes. So I'm gonna keep going. Time goes by so fast, always. Okay. So here are some things you might be thinking, okay, so like where, where, where do we draw the lines? So here's some of the lines that we do draw. So because of the International Ombuds Association state of the practice and our new our unique positioning within an organization, you know, our independence and our impartiality, we are not taking on certain roles and activities. And they're listed here, right? I mentioned it earlier. We're not going to participate in any formal investigations or any formal issue resolution processes that might look like, you know, Title IX or other um, um, institutional equity compliance type um, investigations or hearings or other types of um, processes, we would not get involved in any of that. We don't produce findings, right? We're not making um, findings of anything. We are also not making decisions or overturning decisions. You know, people will often come to us because they're not happy with a decision. We can certainly talk with them through different strategies for addressing it, but we don't have the power or authority to overturn it per se. Um, we're not going to implement, you know, corrective measures. We may bring information to the powers that be who can look into it and maybe take their own, make their own decision to take, you know, make corrective measures. Um, but we're, we don't have the power to do that. Um, we're also not going to serve in other roles that would compromise um, our impartiality or our neutrality. So there are collateral ombuds out there. No problem. They do exist. Um, in universities, sometimes they play different roles, other corporations maybe as well. Um, the key is, can they delineate, right? The key is, can they truly separate one role from the other? If, they, if it gets messy, if there's anything that they're doing in their other roles that would then undermine their role as an ombud. So that's where things can get, um, can get kind of sticky. We're not agents of notice, so we do not receive notice. Um, for, the, um, for the institution or the organization. So if someone does ultimately file a lawsuit and they had visited with the ombuds, you know, a year ago, six months ago, whatever, coming to the ombuds is not considered notice uh, to the organization. Don't create policies. We can certainly influence, you know, we can bring concerns or questions. We can make recommendations. We can review things um, to see, are we seeing something that might be um, helpful as they create policies? We can certainly provide that input. And, you know, and for many of us in ombuds roles, 
we see a much larger population than most other parts of the organization, right? What do I mean? HR is working with employees. Student, um, student affairs is working with students. Faculty affairs is working with faculty. We're working potentially with all of them. So we may connect dots that others in the organization are not able to see. Um, and then, of course, we don't create or maintain identifying records um, of our of our um, visitors. So of course we have to you know, maintain like financial records and things like that, but we don't maintain records that would identify who's using our services or anything that would identify them. Um, we collect aggregate data, um, typically spreadsheets, databases, different ombuds do it differently um, so that we can, if, if, if required, or if, if you voluntarily provide you know, annual reports, quarterly reports, things like that. So we can give meaningful information to leadership. Okay. So I'm going to really, you know, I look at it as bridging the gap, right? Complementing the other resources and providing benefits to both the individual um, and, as well as the um, organization as a whole. So while we are independent and separate from other parts of the organization, we really are a complementary function. And if you look, think, think of it as an effect, you know, as an issue management system, a comprehensive conflict management system, you know, ombuds are an integral part of that. And you can see here kind of where they would fall into the um, series of different options that someone might have. Um, and we, as organizational ombuds, really want to meet with people early and often, right? As soon as you have that knot in your stomach, as soon as something doesn't feel quite right, or you have a question, that's the best time to come to an organizational ombuds. Um, there are some overlapping functions for sure, um, you know, but the reality is that there's a significant population of employees out there, especially that really aren't comfortable using channels like HR or compliance or risk management or even hotlines. Um, and that's part because those entities aren't truly independent, right? They're still part of the management structure. They're still part of the chain of command. They still have a duty. They're an agent of that organization. So they, you know, aren't going to be able to um, really look at it as objectively as an ombuds would be able to, because ultimately they, they are there to protect the organization, right? Where ombuds are not. They're there to look at the big picture, to look at everyone's interests and really try to find a fair and equitable path forward for everybody involved. Um, Chuck Howard, who some of you might know, he was the, um, he's an attorney. He was a longtime advocate for ombuds programs, still is. Um, he was IOA's former executive director, and he also wrote these two books. I don't know if you can see them. I'm going to put them up. Uh, I can also put links to these, or some maybe someone can help me with that. Um, one is the organizational ombudsman. The other is a practical guide to organizational ombuds. This one in particular has tons of really great stories and examples of how organizational ombuds work. I contributed a few of them myself, um, as probably some others did here. So if you, you know, really want some storytelling and um, examples of how this all plays out, that those are some really great resources. But he refers to this idea that I'm trying to get at as the blue uniform problem, right? That um, a lot of these channels, HR compliance, they're really policing functions. Um, they're really trying to make sure that people are following policies, procedures, following the rules, and adhering to the law. And they may have very limited confidentiality, so they might have a duty to report or share information. And that's going to be problematic for people who don't want to risk, you know, um, maybe a boss or a colleague hearing about what's going on or, or getting wind of it, because as you can imagine, that can have its own repercussions, even if it's not, you know, Flagged as retaliation, we all know low-level retaliation can take many forms and may not be, you know, against policy, but it's still going to make someone really miserable. And that's where ombuds can really come in and help because we are, um, we're a channel where we can ask questions, seek guidance, explore options, and people have that hundred percent control over the next step. Hotlines are also problematic because you know, they're limited. They may be suitable for many things, but they don't allow for that back and forth. They don't allow for the discussion, for generating options, for providing coaching, for asking a lot of follow-up questions. Um, it's more of a kind of a one-way dump of information than it lands on someone's desk to look into. So, um, so those are just some of the differences. Okay. 
Um, in some, you know, formal channels are really focusing on reporting the misconduct and unethical behavior, whereas the ombuds are really looking at what are the issues? Let's make sense of this. Let's look at different perspectives. Let's challenge some assumptions that are being made. Um, let's empower and coach people, right, to effectively and efficiently resolve their own issues. Um, let's, you know, find and review and explain policies and procedures so that the person feels more confident and informed in deciding, do I want to report this? And research shows that 80% of people who do come to an ombuds program and, and get that kind of explanation about how a formal reporting process works are more likely to then go and report than they would have had they not talked to an ombuds and just were like paralyzed by fear, right? We're afraid to make that report because they don't know. It's, it's, it's too scary. It's this fear of the unknown. What are the consequences? What's going to happen? Who's going to hear about it? So we can really help them think through and talk through that and, and give them that confidence. Um, and then intervening if needed. And of course, and that's only if both the ombuds and the visitor agree to expressly agree to some kind of intervention, but intervening with whether it's raising concerns to management um, or others. Um, Let's see what are some examples, doing some of the mediation, doing some of the shell diplomacy, um, providing feedback, et cetera. So those are some of the um, kind of how ombuds bridge that gap between all these other resources that may exist within an organization. Um, and we do a lot of referring, and I think my colleagues here would agree, you know, people, HR, compliance, refer people to us all the time because they're really there to implement and enforce policies and procedures. When things get interpersonal or you know more touchy feely, if you will, or it's more um, a soft issue, um, and that's and that's part of the right term to use, but they will refer them to ombuds to try to work those things out or figure those things out. Um, and compliance as well. Oftentimes, people will make formal complaints, and compliance is like, well, this doesn't is it either isn't within our wheelhouse or is it within our jurisdiction? It's not the right kind of issue. Or does it rise to the level of something that we would investigate? Um, then they would also refer us to ombuds. The ombuds will be able to help you work through and find an informal resolution to this issue and, and other, other strategies. Um, so Michelle says, okay, I'm seeing, hang on, I'm gonna go back up. Michelle says, I thought they sh shouldn't refer. Um, Okay, one of these is a direct message, so I'm gonna hold off on that one. Michelle says, I thought they should not refer. Um, no, we refer we refer back and forth all the time. I'm not really sure what you mean by not refer, um, but oftentimes, you know, we're helping people navigate what other resources on uh, in, within an organization might help them address their concern. They're not required to use any of them, but we can certainly let them know they exist and what and what that might look like and refer them out. And then, as I explained just a moment ago, vice versa, other functions within an organization will refer people to um, ombuds regularly. Um, David, I'm going to look at yours in a minute. I see there's a couple others. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. No, so they're not being told to go to ombuds, but it's being presented as an option, right? So they're saying to the um, to the visitor, uh, you know, we can't, we're not going to investigate this. This isn't something that we would help you with. Here are some other options. And they would explain the ombuds role and say ombuds is an option, but it's up to that person to initiate that contact, to reach out to us. Um, to 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 um, explore what the options might be and decide if they want to talk to us or not. So hopefully that um, is answering your question. Okay, uh, let's keep going because we're already oh my gosh forty seven minutes. So before I before I list, I'm actually going to go back. Um, in the chat, okay, thanks Michelle. I'm glad that helped. Um, in the chat, if you would, what do you see as you no? Know, now that I've shared all of this information. What do you see as some of the benefits for either the individual or for the organization? What's the benefit of having an ombuds? Let me hear what you think. Uh oh, I'm not doing a very good job. So I don't see any chats. I've got a question. <laughs> uh, okay. is it, are people more likely to use an ombuds program over a company mediation program? So, I, yeah, so we don't have, so I can't speak to that personally. Um, we don't have a, we don't have a mediation program in our organization. Um, but my familiarity from working as a corporate organizational ombuds 
was that the mediation programs are not informal, right? They're, I mean, they're, they're informal, but not litigation, yes, but they are, you know, it's more of a formal mediation where um, there's records of it. Um, the eight, the organizations, of course, on notice, this is happening. It's part, usually part of um, a formal process. It's like a step in a formal process. Whereas ombuds, it's completely off the record. No one knows or even using it. It's really more of an informal safe space where people want to try to work out their own issues or, or, or go through that go through that process. Their bosses don't have to know about it. The organization doesn't have to know about it. They can really try to address the issues truly informally um, before it gets to any kind of formal process. Does that help answer the question? It does. So an ombuds doesn't. Oops, uh, you're breaking it a little bit. Sorry. Doesn't rely on having other people in there. It could just be the self referral one on one with an ombuds to help them sort out where they're at. Yes, that's a that's a, probably the most common use of ombuds is that one on one. But oftentimes, as a result of that one on one, we learn right there's other people involved or maybe another person involved, and so then we have our different ways of going about like inviting those people to the table and voluntarily they don't have to participate, but if they're willing, um, they then can come in for a facilitated. We call it informal mediation, but it's really a facilitated conversation with the ombuds there as a third party neutral. Okay, I do see a bunch of, oh my goodness, a bunch of questions. Okay, um, okay, so these are good. These are all your input on the benefits, great. Um, hopefully everyone is reading through these. I'm gonna scan them real quick and then we're gonna move on. Um, great, Jason's, I see yours, awesome. Confidentiality, yes, they can bring up, up, bring up things, yes. Con things can, confidentiality is the ombud superpower, yes. I would say influence is also our superpower, um, but yes. Yes, with the bullying, yes. Yes, and Don, yes. And I didn't I didn't hit on that, Don, thank you, because I, I think I, I forgot to mention when I was talking about, uh, and maybe that's actually coming up here in benefits, let's just go there. Um, you know, one of the first benefits I put here is what Don Greenstein saying in the chat is that, you know, a lot of organizations are big and they're complex and they're messy and truly people just don't know where to go. Right. So rather than someone having to figure out, okay, what's my issue? What's the right resource? Who do I need to talk to? They can come to ombuds and we can help them sort all that out. Right. They can come to us. They can tell us what's going on. We help them sort it out. We help them think through the different, you know, places where they might go, what that might look like, what the consequences might be of doing something or doing nothing. Um, and so that's really one of the primary benefits. Um, for individuals. The other one is maybe they do know where to go, but like we've talked about already, there's some trust issues. Maybe they don't trust the organization or the people involved, or maybe they're just afraid it's, it's going to leak, right? If they go, you know, if they if they go to their manager, or they go to a colleague, or they go to someone else, they go to HR, it's going to get back to colleagues, it's going to get back to their boss. And then great, now they're the rat, right? They're the ones that no one trusts. Um, and there might be some of that retaliation, some backlash. So they might want to protect relationships, not harm their reputation, and they can come to us because with their permission, we can anonymously raise issues or bring issues. Um, of course, if it's obvious it's them, we want to talk through that with them. Um, but oftentimes it can be done successfully in an, um, um, in an anonymous fashion because it's a vicious cycle, right? Because if employees feel that if they report or they share information with someone and um, it results in retaliation. Well, then guess what, right? People are going to stop doing it. And then what happens? Well, then the bad behavior or or the um, misconduct continues. And then that becomes the norm, right? Then that becomes the accepted normal behavior. And it's this vicious cycle. So ombuds are really there to try to help break that cycle, give them a place where we can surface issues in a way that's going to protect the anonymity and allow the people who can do something about it take action um, without it without it becoming um, retaliatory. Um, they may just want you know a third person perspective. Um, just maybe they want a sounding board, but they don't think they have enough evidence to make file a report. And they just want to talk it through. Maybe they're international, or they they have they come from a different cultural background, or maybe they're neurodiverse. Right. And they just want someone to talk to, like, this is happening. Like, am I reading it right? Am I not understanding it? Are there nuances that I don't know about? Right. And something doesn't feel good to them. 
but maybe it's okay. You know, so ombuds is a safe place for them to kind of have that conversation and think through that and then think about, okay, what, if anything, do they want to do next? Um, but maintaining anonymity is probably one of the biggest things. And I've got lots of situations where I've been able to take information, take evidence per se, um, to the powers that be, whether it be audit or other investigations, and they and we can discuss how to discreetly look into it without throwing the whistleblower, so to speak, under the bus, right? So it's a really great way to protect whistleblowers because we all know what happens to whistleblowers, right? So ombuds is a great conduit um, to get that information where it needs to go, and we don't have to say where we get it from. And by that, and and one of the things that ombuds, you know, are very keenly aware of is we have to be constantly building that rapport, trust, and credibility with the stakeholders throughout our organization so that when I do go to the head of audit or I do go to an investigator and I say, hey, don't know if any of this has merit or not, but here's what I'm hearing. Here's the information I have. You know, how can we look into this without, without you know, calling out anybody, right? We can really think through some strategic ways to do that. Um, and they trust if I'm bringing it to them, you know, there might be something to it. So those are some ways that we can help in that regard. Okay, we're getting really short on time. I'm not going to read through all these. You can see them, but here are some of the benefits, and I see lots of messages. Um, thanks, Tina. Thanks, others. Um, if you do have to jump off early, thanks so much for being here. It looks like we are at 10 o'clock, not early. Okay, um, so people do have to go. I just want to thank everyone for being here. Um, I don't know, Natalie, Jeff, if um, I had a scenario to work through, but obviously we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Maybe just make sure we've got all the resources in the chat for folks, the links. Um, but take a look at this if you have a time, and I'll share a PDF of the slides so you have this. But here are some ways that can also benefit um, the organization. So here are the links. Um, I think most of them have been put in the chat already. Um, just places where you can get more information about ombuds. And again, thank you all for having me and for listening um, and for being here. So with that, I guess I'll stop. And if people want to stay and ask questions, I'm happy to stay. I don't know um, what our what the leaders think about that. <laughs> Liz, thank you so much. That was a most informative presentation. I know a lot of people on the line started out knowing very little about what ombuds do and are and most informative in that regard. If people are in a position to contribute to the Food Bank of the Rockies, it's www.foodbankrockies.org. That's www.foodbankrockies.org. Thank you very much. We look forward to seeing everybody next week. And with that, we are complete. Okay.